Um, and the recording is now in progress, so um, I'm delighted to welcome uh, Robert today. Uh, he gave an excellent pre uh, plenary in our um, um, conference in April, uh, and um, uh, I'm going to put the reference to that in our um, chat in a few minutes, uh, so you'll be able to go and uh, refer to that if you'd like to. Um, basically, for many years, Robert has been an, in, uh, an interculturalist with both academic and training experience and practical training experience. He had one of the senior positions in, 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 in Germany, working um, for 18 years for Siemens, uh, which is really one of the leaders in intercultural work in Germany, and um, uh, was also uh, won a, um, a diversity and inclusion initiative for um, large numbers of Siemens uh, employees worldwide. He basically is based in Munich in Germany, but is um, moving between um, the UK and, and Germany. Uh, he's a lecturer at the University of München in Munich, and also has been in Berlin and is visiting professor at the uh, business school of the University of Bologna, which we were talking a little bit earlier. And he's also a former vice president of the Society for Intercultural Education Training Research, a thing that we all know as CETA, and um, a founder member and advisor of the uh, CETA Deutschland, which is a very, very active organization. Um, he's also published a number of books and the latest book, which came out uh, last year in uh, 21, is Choose, oh, sorry, Bridge the Culture Gaps, published by the very distinguished publisher in cultural studies, uh, NB Books. Um, and uh, I'll put the details of that in the chat as well, in case you'd like to um, get hold of it, which I think you should. And um, I think with that, Robert, um, over to you from maps to navigation systems and trends in intercultural learning. All okay. Yours. Thank you very much, um, Barry, for that warm welcome. And um, yeah, I'm very pleased to be with you here today and to see also some familiar names. Some people I know very well and some people I know basically from LinkedIn or from a virtual contact, but I welcome you all today. And um, yeah, I'd like to talk about trends in intercultural training. Uh, I call it from maps to navigation systems. I hope you'll understand why a little bit later on. And um, if you do have any um, comments or, or questions, you can write in the chat, uh, but we will have some time at the end for um, for a question and answer. I hope we can have a bit of a dialogue so I can get to know what you think about this. So let's um, talk about really what I want to mention today. Um, I'm going to give a bit of a background to, to where I'm coming from on this topic because there's a lot of people involved in the intercultural field from many different angles. And I think it may be useful without giving you my whole life story, but just to see what angle I'm coming from, uh, what perspective I bring to this. Because, of course, our perspectives influence how we think and uh, our ideas. And there are a lot of trends. I'm going to mention quite a few, but I want to focus on three, which I think are particularly interesting. One is the idea of multiple cultural identities. Some people call this multi-collectivity. The second one is the connection between culture and diversity, equity, inclusion and belonging. Uh, Barry mentioned that that was one of the things I did at Siemens was to be involved with an unconscious bias initiative, actually, which was part of an inclusion mm -hmm. university program. And mm -hmm. that. And the third mm -hmm. area is that there is somebody um, not on mute. Could you make sure you mute your microphone? Somebody coughing. Um, okay, the third area is culture and neuroscience. This is a very, very fascinating area. Uh, I'm not a expert on neuroscience, but I find the ideas that I get filtered through to me extremely interesting. And then I want to give you, there's been some really excellent material produced over the past few years. I want to give you some tips at the end uh, for books, for instance, which will take you further. Um, some of you will know that uh, the organization that Barry just mentioned, CETA, we recently had a, uh, uh, our first face-to-face uh, -face conference for some time in Malta, it was a, a, a fantastic event. And there we were, the title of that conference was Rethinking Interculturalism. And um, I must say, um, 
I was also very stimulated by some of the ideas there. So I realized that this is an interesting topic for people to think, okay, it's time to look at this field and to see where it's going and what's happening at the moment. Okay, so that's the plan. Um, just where I'm coming from, uh, Barry mentioned that I worked for 18 years at Siemens. Uh, Siemens is a, a, a very large multinational engineering company. Um, it's now sort of broken up a bit into different parts, but when I was there for much of the time, it had about, at the peak, it had 460,000 people in 190 countries worldwide. So this was an amazing place just to work and just to be uh, and to travel around and to see the Siemens sign in all sorts of places all over the world. And my job took me to many places because I was doing intercultural training, but I was also facilitating meetings. I was involved with change programs. I was involved with international initiatives. So I felt it was a great privilege to be able to actually combine my real passion for intercultural studies with my work um, traveling around and to go to places and meet people who were local people. They were not always then uh, top management, some of them were, and they were not uh, always international people. So I felt I was getting a taster for many different cultures. And I worked in a very intercultural team with a Chinese colleague, a German colleague, and, and so forth. Um, the other pictures show other elements of my experience, which maybe are relevant. As Barry also mentioned, um, I have been an um, adjunct professor at the Bologna Business School. That's the business school of the University of Bologna, situated in this beautiful villa outside of Bologna. Um, and that is where I've been teaching cross-cultural management. At the bottom right, you see some of my students um, a couple of years ago who were on the Global MBA program. And what I found very interesting with them was not just the fact that they were from many different cultures, national cultures. Um, typically, you'd have 60 students in the group, very large group, and perhaps 45, 50 different nationalities. Uh, that was interesting, but actually even more interesting, I found was that they came from different professional backgrounds. So I had students with uh, who were focusing on food and wine, which is a MBA program in Bologna, interestingly enough. I, Thought it was a joke to start with, but actually it's a real program, very important program because the food and wine industry is very important for Italy and for the Emilia Romana region. And uh, those students alongside students studying sustainable energy, uh, many students from, um, from Africa actually, from countries like Nigeria, Ethiopia, Uganda, where um, they um, were sponsored by the Italian government to come and study in Bologna to do an MBA program. So that was a great perspective, seeing these people from different professional backgrounds coming together. On a private level, um, my wife is uh, Chinese and that's our wedding in Beijing. Um, and so before the pandemic, um, I was traveling quite regularly to China, perhaps more on a personal level than a, um, than a professional level, although I have done workshops in China. And that gave me a bit of a shock as an interculturalist because I was having to deal with real situations and, and I realized how important the topic was for me personally. And that's us doing our Tai Chi in the Olympic Park in Beijing. And I used, as Barry mentioned, also the lockdown last year to, to write a book where I was bringing together my experiences. And I'll, I'll mention a bit later on about that. Um, and what, the, what led me to think about trends was the fact that I, before I joined Siemens, when I was a university lecturer in Germany, um, I'd written a book before in 2000, but I, I wrote quite a lot of articles in the meantime, but I didn't have time to write a book. And I thought um, about, well, what was different in 2000 um, from the situation 20 years later? And uh, I put together some of the things that I feel have changed in the intercultural field. One big thing I think into, is the whole expansion of the intercultural field. When I was preparing my book, uh, obviously I started before 2000, that's when it was published in about 1998 or so, I, could, I would come to, to London from Germany and I would go to one of the big bookshops like Foils and I would buy almost any book that there was on this topic. And uh, I remember buying, being delighted to find a book which was also about maps of culture called Mind Your Manners by John Moll. I see it's still going. Um, that was one of the first books and that was really, he calls it the uh, the mole map, you know, and that was about maps and 
it was about kind of, I, was, I thought that was great. And then I discovered uh, Trump and us riding the waves of culture. I thought, this is fantastic. This is what I need. And the works of uh, people like Richard Lewis and Hofstede. And that, those were those days. But basically, the field was developing and there was not a lot around. Now, if I go to a, a bookshop or I look on Amazon, there's, there's books being published all the time on this topic. It's really expanded. In Germany, there are numerous um, places where you can study intercultural studies that didn't exist at that time very much. And the whole field has, has grown and it's grown obviously with, uh, with globalization. So um, when I was doing the book, um, I was challenged actually by, it seemed to me every week I looked and found some new challenge for me about how to put together in a practical way um, what's happening in the intercultural field. Because I was reading things or hearing at conferences, things like, okay, we can't talk about icebergs. And I thought, oh, I've got some, I've been looking for years for beautiful iceberg pictures. And I put them in every seminar. I looked at all the Siemens communication seminars and almost all had iceberg. I think the trainers love icebergs. There's some background noise again, if everybody could check there on mute. Yeah, okay, maybe somebody joining us. Um, and then I hear Milton Bennett, a, 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 an interculturist who I respect a lot, saying we can't talk about icebergs. Icebergs are too fixed and too rigid. We, um, we can't have that. So, okay, can't use the iceberg. And then I think, oh, we can't talk, really talk about Hofstede because uh, that's not relevant anymore. His research, which was very important uh, in the early stages. Um, and then um, I saw, uh, I'd just been doing this big initiative that Barry mentioned about unconscious bias, but then I, I read in 2020 um, and later 2021, uh, big debates about unconscious bias training in the US and then in the UK. Um, and I saw even last week an article in the Daily Telegraph uh, saying that diversity training uh, is counterproductive and a waste of time and money, and it shouldn't be done by a civil servant. So these were challenges to things that I really believed in. Then there was the political challenge of saying, okay, how do we as interculturists respond to Black Lives Matter? And we can't just sit around and play with ideas. We, we maybe need to get engaged in society more and, uh, and get political about things. And that's, uh, I think, an ongoing debate. Then uh, when I was just finishing my book and somebody wrote me a very kind uh, message in LinkedIn and said, um, I see you talk about interculture. Shouldn't we be talking about transculture? And that's particularly a big trend in Germany. A lot of people are, um, are using this term transcultural. Um, so I think, oh, do I have to rewrite my book and include this word, which I don't use actually. I thought, oh, I missed out on that one. And then the big thing perhaps is some people saying well, we shouldn't really talk about culture at all, that culture is um, too vague, it's not suitable for research, uh, it means lots of things to lots of different people. Maybe uh, a lot of the ideas we have are quite offensive, that we're actually um, othering people by talking about differences, that we should not be talking about cultural differences at all. So all those things were happening, and my desire was to write something that was of practical use, use of my practical experience, but I wanted to reflect those uh, trends. So I put together this list, which I actually was amazed when I posted this on LinkedIn. It's by far the most popular post. I just posted this slide, and I thought it was a bit, a bit weak, actually, just putting a slide there, and I was just trying to promote my book and get some attention. But... Uh, I don't know how many people, so I think maybe it was 70,000 or something people viewed it, many, many more than my normal post, which with 10 people look at or whatever, this is massive. And I thought this is a topic that interests people. And so I put together this list of these main trends that I would like to briefly mention, and then I will focus on the three things that I talked about at the beginning. The first big area is, I think, and not everybody was doing this, I must admit, but I think many people, including myself, we were primarily focusing in 20 years ago, we were looking at national cultures, saying, let's talk about the difference between the Chinese and the Russians and the Americans and so forth. And now people are, um, are challenging this and saying, well, actually, we all have multiple cultural identities. OK, I was born in Britain, but I've spent more than half my life in Germany. Uh, so what does that make me? Um, in Britain, they say uh, they react to me a bit strange. I've just been here for a few days and I find 
lots of culture shock, not quite knowing what people want from me. And they are a bit puzzled by my reaction because I'm not familiar, although they think I'm super British perhaps, but I'm, I, I don't have some of the experiences that you would do if you lived your whole life there. And there are more things to marginal cultural identities than that, which I will go into later. As I mentioned before, people are challenging a static view of culture and seeing culture as something fluid. The German professor, um, Jürgen Bolton in Jena, he talks about fuzzy cultures. I quite like that term. And I know that in the UK, um, people like um, Helen Spencer Oti uh, are talking very much about the importance of context uh, when they talk about culture. Um, as I said to you before, people, I think in my job at Siemens, we were talking about intercultural competence. And now, uh, and it is from the um, OECD and the, and the PISA um, studies and so forth, and, and the EU are talking about global competence, and some people are talking about transcultural competence. I think a big breakthrough is, is that uh, there's now stronger connections between intercultural work and the work of people involved with diversity. But again, we don't just talk about diversity, now we talk about diversity, and then people included that added inclusion. And then people said, well, actually, we need to include equity. So we have diversity, equity, and inclusion. And then people now are saying, well, we need to also include belonging. So we have diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging. So these things are continually adding, and, and rightly so. I think um, we've always talked about stereotyping. I think that's a fa fundamental thing uh, that you do when you're an interculturist, and you can have a good laugh about stereotypes, and you can look at them. But actually now, I think people, based on this work in neuroscience, are looking at um, what you can call the cultures in the mind. Uh, that's a, a, a phrase from Perry Hinton, who wrote a very interesting, from the University of Warwick, he wrote a very interesting book about stereotypes, which he really goes into a lot of depth about the history of how stereotypes are used, what they mean. And he talks about culture in mind. I quite like that, or I see this as actually cultural filters. Um, slightly more controversial is the term unconscious bias. Um, more neutral, perhaps, is the term cognitive bias. Um, I think the focus, if we move away from the topics to what we were trying to do, um, if I think of my early work, early days working with individuals and teams and organizations within a, in a company, it was really the focus was on coping with difference, dealing with difference, working with people. And now I like the idea, which is in a book, which I'll mention at the end, which I very much like, which came out last year uh, by Christoph Barmeyer and some of his colleagues. He's the professor in Passau in Germany. And uh, Christoph talks about constructive intercultural management. So not so much focusing on the problems and uh, all the issues, but focusing on um, the positive signs, creating synergies, bringing people together and making one plus one equal three rather than two or uh, less. The target groups also are changing for intercultural training. A lot of the audience for intercultural training and the basis of some of the studies, I think in, in 20 years ago was really a lot of managers. You were doing surveys of managers, people asking, how is it? And they were going on a delegation abroad for three to five years from Germany to Brazil. How did they cope with that, helping them? Or students, the students, of course, were a captive audience for the researchers because uh, it's quite easy to do things with students. You've got your students there and you can do questionnaires, get managers to fill in a form for 20 minutes. It's not so easy. But now I think um, those groups are still important. Of course, we have students traveling around the world and just talking to, to Barry at the beginning before we started about, he'd just been at a conference about, um, intercultural aspects of a higher education and, and, and helping uh, students and professors and so forth to cope with this uh, international education market. I think that's a very important area. Those areas are still important, but we've got new areas. And I, I think the big one, of course, is people dealing with, uh, with migration, with people moving around. At the moment, we have more people on the move in the world for all sorts of reasons um, than ever before. And um, these people are faced with, um, with real issues and the social workers are also faced with those issues too. And I realized the limits of my work when I was asked during the peak of the um, um, of refugees coming to, to Germany um, a few years ago when we had sometimes a weekend, we had 20,000 people arriving in Munich. 
And some of them were unaccompanied minors. And these um, social workers who were used to dealing with German youth or whatever, and very highly professional, they felt they couldn't cope with the, uh, with the style of some of these um, people that they were having to work with. And, you know, they had issues like, how do you stop someone smoking in the dining room when it's not allowed? Um, and do you use force or do you use argument? And so I did some intercultural training for them, but I found it was actually quite a challenge and, and at, the, at, the, at the fringe of my skill and my professional tool set, toolkit, but those are very important groups. Um, medics, you have, um, I, I, again, in Munich where I, I live is basically a challenge for many medical staff to deal with people from different cultural backgrounds. How do they deal with pain? How, do they, how far is the family involved in decisions about their, about their treatment? So that's a big new area. And although uh, medical staff are highly competent, of course, in their own field, sometimes they feel quite challenged by these, uh, these cultural and communication aspects. Another area which some of um, people are working on, I've not personally been involved with this, but I know that um, several people that I've been talking to recently are working with a quite an eclectic group. These are people working on these cargo ships who bring our, our goods, our food, everything across the world working in extraordinarily difficult circumstances at sea for months at a time in very confined situation and terrible environment perhaps, uh, and in a very multicultural environment, people from different nationalities, different languages, different backgrounds, and how to, how to help them to get on with each other, to work together, how to help the, the people who are managing them as well. I think about 20 years ago from the source of what we're doing, a lot came from interviews, surveys of people, a mixture of quantitative quality research. And now, as I say, there's a big breakthrough with some of the ideas on neuroscience. And in delivery, how do we deliver training? Of course, um, there was e-learning in, in uh, 20 years ago, but primarily much of the intercultural training was face-to-face. -face. And now we're, we're, we're dealing, and this has been accelerated obviously by the pandemic, we're doing a lot of virtual training or hybrid training, coaching. And the companies now are talking about uh, not just training, but they're telling, talking about learning ecosystems. I, I like this term. Um, that's something uh, my ex-boss at Siemens has been developing now uh, and was happening when I left a couple of years ago, is to develop not just training programs, not just coaching, but a whole learning ecosystem. That learning takes place not just in a classroom, it takes place through all sorts of means. I'll say a bit more about that at the end. And then, uh, and this was a very big topic in Malta at the Seattle conference, was getting away from US and European perspectives. Somebody gave a paper there actually, or it was actually a keynote speech at the beginning. Australian academic had looked at how Anglo-Saxon much of the research in the intercultural field is. So she'd actually analyzed uh, where the research was being done. And it was, it was I, I always knew it was dominated, but it's just almost exclusively happening in US, in UK, Australia, these places. Does that really represent the world? And um, those perspectives are very powerful. So I think that many people um, are looking for diverse perspectives and multiple paradigms and um, realizing that some of the perspectives we have are actually um, in, in a way neo-colonial because we're, we're actually forcing them on other people. Okay, let's move on now to the first um, area that I want to focus on in, in the second part of my uh, presentation. Uh, and that's this idea of multiple cultural identities. So um, culture for me is actually the best definition I've found as a working definition is a shared system of attitudes, values, meanings, beliefs, and behavior. I think that originally came from Robert Coles, one of the uh, early US uh, interculturalists, a shared system of attitudes, meanings, beliefs, and behavior. And to me, that can be a national culture. I think there are identifiable systems of meanings, beliefs, behavior in different countries, but they're not always determined by that. And this, my, um, I think my, what I say is probably confirmed by the academics, but uh, I would be interested if, if we have anybody with academic background in the group today to hear your comments on this. But my experience was certainly this. Um, I, and I'll give you one example to illustrate this. Um, I was asked some years ago to run an intercultural sensitivity program for software architects. So this was part of a, um, a certification program for so-called senior software architects. 
Now, for a company uh, which is highly dependent on software like uh, like Siemens, uh, these are an important group, and and it means that they get attention. They get uh, a lot of training. They get very high quality training. They're the budget and so forth. They're not actually big issues, uh, which they might be for other groups, because these people are so crucial to the success of the company and so hard to get and so hard to keep in the company, you do everything for them. So they said, we, we recognize that these people are working internationally and they need to have intercultural sensitivity. Uh, a typical team at that time was people based in Germany, but also based in, in India and the US and um, perhaps in China or Russia. Um, so I got the, uh, I was given one day to run a course and I was given the participant list, you know, as you get before the course, I looked at it and I saw the, where these people were based and I thought, wow, this is going to be really interesting. We've got people from all of those places. We've got people from every continent and we're going to have great discussions about, about cultures, I mean, national cultures. Some... Um, but actually, I, when I got to work with these people, I realized that the national culture things were not a problem at all. The problem was actually that they had was not dealing with each other and their nationality. It was dealing with people with a different professional background. They were having to provide, of course, develop software for clients. Their clients were within the company, might be HR department wanting to roll out a global uh, project. Um, but actually, um, they were not always getting on with these people. So I saw that they were struggling with these professional backgrounds, like, um, for instance, typically with this HR project that I was involved with, the HR people would say the software people don't give us uh, what we want. Um, and the um, software people say, well, they never know what they want. They can't articulate what they want. So we have, um, we have a challenge there. And I realized when I started looking at it and working within this very big company and moving around, it was connected sometimes with the sector that you're in. The finance people seem different from the people in engineering or the sale or, or the healthcare um, were different. Um, again, we have some noise. I don't know if somebody could go on mute, please check again. Um, we have corporate culture. I noticed that when we were working with different companies, when, when Siemens acquired companies from different countries, we had the professional background I've mentioned before. Even the sites were different. There was a culture actually um, when, when I moved even in Munich between various different sites in Munich. I'm just stopping because there's some some somebody talking in the background. If we can stop that, so that sounds like a German voice. Okay, um, the sites were different. Teams have different cultures. Departmental cultures can be important. Um, the position: Are you in the management, or are you like a team assistant, or something? That would be um, actually uh, a different culture and the function that you have. So what are you doing? Um, are you a team assistant? Are you a manager? Are you um, um, maybe um, a, a software developer or whatever? And I also found interesting was actually the length of service, how, many, how, how long people have been in the company. That affected how far they were actually part of that culture, how far they dissimilated the culture, as opposed to someone who just joined. And so I think I felt that we have to take into all of those things into account. And now comes the link a little bit with, um, with diversity, basically, uh, diversity and inclusion, is to say, then I started looking at the classic diversity um, dimensions. We call this the wheel of difference. And, and these are on three levels, basically. So in the middle, of course, is the individual. And then you have, according to the level, the amount that you can actually change this, the, the first ring, uh, it's, it's hard to change those things. Things do change, like, of course, your age, and some things can be changed. But basically, uh, those are fairly fixed. The second outer level are, are things that are more fluid, and, the, uh, and the, the outer circle is the factors that I just mentioned concerning the work culture or organizational culture. So I thought, well, these actually, there's a, this is, we're talking about the same thing here. Really. We're talking about 
okay, maybe I talked about lengths of service, but we're talking about the age of people. We have generational cultures. We have a lot of literature about uh, gender cultures and sexual orientation. We have the, the topic of race and ethnicity. We have national origin and physical and mental ability. And we can treat these like uh, cultures, not wanting to put people into boxes or categories, but thinking about the things that we need to consider in order to understand how these people tick and how they work and to work with them more effectively. And then we have some influencing factors, uh, factors outside religion, education, family status. These things can change. Of course, you can get married or divorced or you can have children, socioeconomic status, political views, appearance can also change. You can have a tattoo. Something that was actually a big issue in the diversity training was getting acceptance of people who had visible uh, tattoos in certain roles regional culture and location. So this, uh, this is adapted from, a, from this model, um, Gardens of Atsaroa, um, and um, I find it very useful. And it's, it's not a checklist really, but it's just a, uh, a collection of factors that you need to consider if you want to understand people. And those are the classic things that diversity and inclusion experts talk about and monitor and measure and encourage and uh, and deal with. So I thought this is a nicely coming together of these two different areas. And then I looked uh, at the next area, which is really the classic cultural factors that you might know as cultural dimensions. Not all of them are really strictly speaking dimensions. And I thought, okay, how can we use these? Because I do find them useful. I find them, it is useful to people to understand about nonverbal communication or about uh, individualism and collectivism, I think the terms are useful. And the terms were developed primarily by people like Edward Hall and Hofstede and Trump and us to understand national cultures. But I thought, why can't we use them also to understand all these other cultures and that wheel of difference? They're, they're really um, the same sorts of things and they're more general things. So in, in my book, actually, I try to remove sometimes the national cultures, although the critical incidents are real cases and there are real cultures behind them, but just get people to think about, okay, what elements of communication style could be playing a role? Is it nonverbal? Is it to do with low and high context, directness, indirectness, person and task? Without saying, okay, the Germans are direct and the British or the Chinese are indirect, but just saying, okay, in this case, with this situation, in this context, this is what was happening. And with the space idea, it's to do with public and private space, not just a physical distance, but actually, how much do you open up in public? How much do you socialize with your business partners, for instance? Of course, the individualism and collectivism, do you make decisions as an individual alone or do you make decisions in a group? Uncertainty avoidance, um, what is your attitude to, to uncertainty? Is it a high uncertainty avoidance or low? Power distance to do with the hierarchy, uh, rules, uh, do you have universalist rules and particularist rules? And then these different aspects of time. Now, those, you, those most of you, I'm sure, are very, very familiar with this. This is a mixture of Edward Hall and Trompenas and, and uh, Gerd Hofstede. Um, but uh, my plea is to relate these, uh, not just to national cultures, but to the um, all types of culture. The next area which I want to, to briefly mention is now the connection with the idea of stereotypes and filters in our brain. Um, we know that um, this is a slide from Google that they actually give you permission to use. It was from an unconscious bias program that they had at, uh, at Google called Google, uh, Unconscious Bias at Work. And there we have uh, a graphic showing that every second we're faced with 11 million bits of information, but we can only process a, uh, a very small part of this 40 bits they, they talk about. So these 40 bits then are go through our filter in our brain. It depends if we're in our, according to Daniel Kahneman, if we're in a reflective mode or if we're in an automatic mode, um, how far we are aware of these filters. But most of the time, we're not really aware of those filters. And that's where the idea of unconscious bias comes in, or if you prefer culture filters. I find this a very useful definition by Sandy Sparks from the University of Warwick, uh, seeing unconscious bias as something which is implicit a pattern of thought, something we're not aware of, happens automatically, triggered by our brain. And our brain has to make these quick assessments because we can't uh, think about everything all the time. We're, the brain has to save energy as well because the brain uses 
a large amount of energy in the body and is on sort of energy saving mode. So we need to make these um, quick assessments to react. We can't think about everything consciously that we do in a day. We don't think about it when we're um, brushing our teeth or when we're breathing. Uh, this is not possible. Our conscious, unconscious minds process vastly more information than our conscious mind by using these shortcuts. And these shortcuts are based on our background, cultural environment and personal experience. So these are things that are, are individually, everybody has a different wiring, basically. You can't say all the Chinese think like that or act because, okay, it depends. What did you do in China? Where, where did you live? What was your exposure to other people? What sort of a teacher did you have? Did you have a teacher with red hair who you didn't like? And now you react to people as an adult because somebody has red hair and you don't give them the job when they apply for it. So these are all these very subtle things that in unconscious bias training, if it's done properly, uh, people become aware of. Um, okay, so moving on to thinking about um, what we do about all of this actually. Uh, to me, I think that the, um, we, we can be thinking about all this stuff, but basically uh, in, a, in, in a business setting, in a work setting, um, I, and this is based on, on a very old concept by Milton Bennett, but I, I try to apply it to the practical work. I see different levels of this uh, intercultural competence or what I, the term I like very much is, is cultural agility, actually. There's people talk about um, global dexterity, cultural agility, and uh, I, I particularly like cultural agility because I think it appeals to many business people who are actually talking about agile a lot at the moment. Um, a few weeks ago, I was invited by Siemens to give a, uh, a talk about culture and agile. And this is part of an agile conference um, worldwide for, for IT people, but for also for other parts of the company. So they, they can recognize this. And basically to be culturally agile, you need to go through these different phases, basically accepting difference, understanding difference, uh, maybe adapting to difference. Uh, something I always have to remember when I come to the UK to bring my adapter plug from uh, continental Europe. Um, making teams work and function. Uh, and ultimately, I suppose then, what I would call bridging cultures, connecting people, teams, organizations in a synergistic way. So you get to this um, constructive intercultural management. So something, a word about this term bridging, which I think is very important. And this is basically, my philosophy is to try to, there's nothing original really, it's the original is combining two models. One model is um, the um, so-called mapping, bridging, and integrating model, um, which is, I think, a very powerful uh, model, um, which is basically the, the key to the idea of bridging. But combining that model uh, with a, um, a model called the three-factor model, which says that actually we need to understand not culture as something uh, which is isolated, but culture is to be understood in connection with uh, context and situation. Um, you may ask, what's the difference between context and situation? Context to me is the big picture. So this would be in this case, in this uh, simplified image is the weather. The situation is uh, actually what's happening on the water there. So in a, in a real business context, the context might be the pandemic might be the recession or the boom time. And the situation would be the interface between um, a customer and a supplier or two colleagues or a manager, an employee, whatever it is, those would be the, or a merger and acquisition. My, um, my attempt is here to show basically that to bridge cultures, to create these uh, synergies and to move forward and use culture in a constructive way and difference to leverage um, business success, you need to first, in the first step, you need to scan your own culture. So you need to be aware of, and we see the wheel of difference at the bottom there. So we need to be aware of all those factors without being paralyzed them, by them, but just think about them, be aware of them. What, what's influenced by me, by my age? What's influenced by me, by my, um, by my education, by my gender, by my, my professional background? All those things need to be thought about. And then you can scan basically culture to uh, the people you're dealing with. It could be an individual or a, um, a team or an organization. And then um, the next stage would be to identify the differences and the similarities, 
The fourth stage then is to actually create a common vision where you want to go together. And the fifth one is to actually implement these, what you want to do. Um, this is basically a very simplified, again, model of this learning ecosystem. To do this, you need a lot of support and help, and it can be training, but bear in mind that it's not just training. It can be these a very uh, powerful uh, diagnostic tests. There, there are all sorts of tests, assessment tests, development tests. It can be sharing best practice with people. It can be knowledge sharing through reports, country profiles. It can be through a whole range of resources from selfie videos to uh, in-depth academic uh, papers. Those are all part of this toolkit. Um, one key concept, which I think is very interesting, I'd just like to briefly mention, I'm going to give you some time for questions very soon, um, is the idea of nudging. This is, uh, I think, a powerful idea which is influencing many of our aspects of our lives, particularly in, in the pandemic, we've experienced how we're being nudged into particular behavior. It originated from problems they had in Amsterdam airport with the uh, gentleman's uh, uh, toilets there where uh, the target was not being hit sometimes. And so they tried to think of ways uh, of getting men to be more accurate. And uh, I apologize if that's uh, not so savory, but that's a very powerful example. It actually did cut the cleaning costs at the airport significantly. People then were challenged and they responded and they behaved in a different way. Or well, this one is a picture in Munich, people queuing for the bread shop. They want people to queue in a particular way. So they put the footsteps there or encouraging people to use the stairs rather than the escalator. Um, okay, I want just a brief word on where you can go further. Uh, those are some of the things I've mentioned. Um, the first one, Christoph Barmeyer, uh, Madeleine Bausch and Ulrike Meyerhofer, uh, Constructive Intercultural Management, are very good, particularly good maybe if you're working with students there, it's, it's like a textbook and very up-to-date, very, uh, very comprehensive. The, um, I don't know if she coined this phrase, but the, a very good description of this cultural identity is this book, uh, Build Your Cultural Identity. The next one, um, Mai Nguyen with her cross-cultural management with insights into brains, a very, very interesting uh, uh, link there between, if you want to really go into that topic in more detail, I highly recommend that book. A lot, of, a lot of depth there. And she's also a very dynamic speaker. She spoke at the conference in Malta. And if you like to follow up on the nudging, um, I had the pleasure of working with Lisa Kempinski. Uh, um, and her book with Tina Nielsen is, uh, is really a great compendium of activities for, um, for, for, for doing nudging, which would encourage inclusion and help to cultural understanding. Of course, you can, you can get my book. What I try to do is listed here. I try to cover various types of culture to do the things I've been talking about. And those pictures are taken from the book, connecting diversity, culture, and neuroscience, addressing not just managers, it's also for all team members, using really authentic examples, not making them up to fit my concept, but the other way around, making up the concept to fit the examples. Uh, it's also, um, and I, I hope that, that you'll find that interesting, it's interactive, it's a self-help guide, um, it's practical. And one thing I'm quite proud of as an ex-language uh, teacher is that I feel it's written in very clear international English, which I think is important. I think too many management books are in English, which is very eloquent, but not comprehensible. So I'd like to open up the floor now for, um, we've got about 10 minutes for questions. Barry, if you can moderate the discussion. I'm delighted, yes, thank you. It's, um, that was exceptionally interesting and useful. Thank you so much, Robert. Really, really appreciate that. I'm sure we all do. Um, fascinating that you mentioned Lisa Kepinski and nudging conclusions, because we're hoping very much that Lisa will be able to do a webinar like yours uh, in a, a few months' time. So we're looking forward to that possibility. We're in touch with her right now. OK, now on questions, um, I don't have any specific questions raised in the chat at the moment. If you would like to have a question raised, by all means, feel free, please, to raise your hand, uh, mark raise your hand icon, uh, or put a question in. Um, and let me lead off, if I may, uh, Robert, with a couple that have come up from my own side. Um, the first one concerns theory. I think you're right that in our current hyperconnectivity and the fact that people are living in different communities all over the world, the notion of allying theory to particular cultures 
no longer has a validity it used to, or we thought it used to, um, and people like Richard Lewis, etc., are, are honoring that. However, I find the concept, the theories, are actually still very valuable to apply. What's your view? Um, yeah, I, 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 I think the, the, uh, the theoretical work is, is very important. I'm not sure if, how far I've understood your point here, but um, I do see... The point is, go for the concepts. Go. Don't go for the location. Don't go for the country. The country, absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's that is precisely what I really been um, been trying to stress. The concepts are really useful, and I find them they're useful. People, uh, it's like an eye opener when you present them to people. But the mistake is how you apply those. So I think we have to be grateful for those people who made up those concepts. Uh, I'm eternally grateful to Edward Hall and, and Hofstede and Trompenas and people for coming up with those terms. My criticism would be, I think we we now need to apply them to the whole range of culture. So I would agree with you. Uh, a general point about, uh, I do feel there's a bit of a gulf between the academic world and the practical world. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a pity. I think we uh, that's where organizations like your own and CETA need to, I think, try to bring those, bridge the cultural gaps between those two groups of people, because I think that's a bit sad. Um, I think we're, and, and it's not no one's to blame, we're talking past each other some of the time. Okay, and if I may, one more point before I go over to Rob, who's got a question he's raised. Um, basically, um, I would no longer, a lot of my colleagues will insist on teaching the Hofstede 6, the Trompenas 7, you know, the rules as uh, the models as for a particular uh, thinker. I won't do that. I will look at the client I'm working with in business primarily, and I will choose the concepts which I think are applicable to their particular situation. Would you tend to agree with that approach? Uh, that's exactly, uh, I think I'm trying to do something similar with my, I call that uh, sort of mind map that I, uh, sort of spider diagram that I showed uh, of the cultural factors. I would say it's trying to do exactly that. I don't think anybody in business really cares where they come from. Um, they don't need to know it's Hofstede or something. Uh, they're interested in those, comp that's why I've sort of mixed them around. Mm -hmm. I think that's what uh, also, Erin um, Meyer does in her book, which is yes. highly successful. I'm very jealous of her because that's, <laughs> I see her book everywhere. I'm waiting for mine to be at the airport, but, she, as <laughs> as hers. but I shouldn't be so nasty, but she's, she's sort of managed to do that a bit. Um, Mind and yes. It appeals to people, but it's, so I, I would say that's exactly what we need to do. Um, and, um, and that's very, very useful. Yeah. And, and apply them, as you say, to the, uh, to the needs of the client. I think that's a, a fundamental way of thinking, which is mm -hmm. important is not to say they need to know this, but get from them, what do they, what helps them? Good, thank you for that. Rob Howard from BSIG raised a question about global dexterity and um, agility. Rob, would you like to raise that with Robert or um, shall I just take it from uh, the chat? No, I just wanted to get, I missed the actual term global dexterity. I found it interesting. Um, do you know who coined that? Uh, yeah, it's, um, it, it's, it's a book and it's based on, um, his name is Molinsky. I'm trying to yeah, find Andy it. Andy Molinsky. Uh, yeah, right that's here. right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. And that's, that he, he has a whole like a toolbox based on that. Um, mm -hmm. As far as I know, it's a bit linked to national cultures, but there's no reason that it can't be adapted to this other approach, of, like we've been talking about reducing it. But, but I, I think the, uh, I think it's a very strong term actually. I like this global agility. I think that um, that's my advice also to the academics. We need to find terms that appeal to people. This is a little bit my problem with this transcultural um, debate. I understand what, and I go along completely with it, but. I don't think that term is going to appeal to people. I think we need yeah. to terms that talk the language of our clients. I, I had to do that a lot because I was selling internally in the company uh, training. And I, I did a, a Google search actually, um, when people were asking, why don't you talk about transculture? And I, I found that if you just find the number of, when you do a Google search, you find how many mentions are there. And, mm -hmm. and it was like, um, massively more for global competence than for intercultural competence and very few for this transcultural competence relative to each other. Yeah. Great. Okay, thank you, Robert. Okay, thanks very much, Robert. Um, thank you, Rob. Um, Vincent Merck has a question. Uh, Vincent, would you like to um, unmute yourself? 
<clears throat> yes, sure. With pleasure. Hi, Robert. Uh, Hi, can, can, can you hear me? Because I had a problem with my headset. Can, can you hear yeah, me? Very clearly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Now, I, I, I like your, your remark about the professional culture, which sometimes is an advantage when people share the same culture, obviously, but sometimes it's a disadvantage where they don't do that. And that's my observation, of course, as well. I'd like to have your take on multidisciplinarity because it's one of the aspects of diversity we often forget. Um, how, do you, yeah, how do you approach that? Because it's, it's of course, a mix of all kinds of aspects, cultures, professional. Uh, if I think of you, you will of, uh, yeah. of the workplace. Yeah. Um, do you, you, I don't think I've, I've, I've used the term very much, but what is your take on this uh, particular concept of multidisciplinarity, multidisciplinarity here? Yeah. Multi, I, 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 uh, yeah, as you're right, I, I haven't really used the term. Um, multidisciplinarity, um, can you tell me what, what, what do you understand by that? What is, the, what is behind that term? Yeah, I, I make, of course, the difference between inter and multi, because multidisciplinarity yeah. is what uh, groups have, at, whether it's at work, in university, or in, a, in business. They have, they have multi, multi uh, a group of, uh, of professions working together on a challenge, for example. And then you want to, of course, try to make them inter, and that they, are, they relate to one another. So from my, my take on that is more the professional aspect of that. How, how, when you put professions together, and they that creates synergy, or maybe does not. Yeah. And it's one of the cultural elements, also one of the aspects of of, uh, of diversity. We often forget, by the way, this multidisciplinarity approach. We always think of gender, um, age, sexual orientation, culture, but the multidisciplinarity is often forgotten. So that you know, the a group of professions together, and how do you mix that and make make a, a whole? Okay. No, no, I just wanted to check. Um, yeah how you were using that. Um, I think this is absolutely a very key area in these teams. And I could see that's what the highly productive teams were. I think it works on an individual level that you get people who are multi-skilled basically, who, who have experience of different disciplines. Um, if I think of the interculturalists in our field, those people who've studied like my, uh, the, the, um, the person who wrote that book on neuroscience and culture, she took the trouble to study neuroscience. You know, to, my, uh, yeah. So you know her from, um, you know her very well, I know. Um, and that's a very big strength and you need that in, a, in an effective team nowadays. It's not enough to have like someone just like a nerd for one topic. They need to be nerds in different topics. And, uh, and, then, and then the people who are managing the team and the team members need to know how to deal with that, how to cope with someone who's got a fundamentally different disciplinary background. Uh, that was one challenge I had as someone who comes from an arts background with engineers or, or with finance people or something. Yeah, no. <laughs> <Not> familiar. <laughs> okay, thank okay, you. Yeah. Thank you very much, Vincent. Thank you, Robert, for that. Um, one more thing. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, Carolyn Riffel has just put in a... Um, uh, 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 in the chat from Andy Molinsky, the subtitle is best, how to adapt your behavior across cultures without losing yourself in the process. And says that Molinsky's approach is very practical, advising us to choose just a couple of dimensions impacting and more importantly, to practice in low risk situations and decide to what extent you can change your behavior. So the number of issues raised here by Carolyn Riffel. Number one, how do you adapt without losing yourself? Don't yeah. choose too much. Yeah. And well, um, Carolyn, do you want to uh, come in on it? Because I think you can do better than me. Yeah. Um, I really like Malinsky's book because it's hardcover, but is set up as a workbook. Um, and he's just very practical, do what you can. You do have to stretch and get beyond a comfort zone, but, um, but that's the piece of you practice and you practice low risk situations and then escalate it so that you can get comfortable, not feeling like you lost yourself, and that you can get comfortable with the discomfort that's always going to be there a little bit. So for those of us who are in English 
community or intercultural communication, sometimes it's just a few words that you have to practice saying, get comfortable saying to interject your opinion in a meeting when you're used to waiting to be called on, that kind of thing. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I'd like to comment on that. Thank you very much. I also like that very much. I, um, I really like the idea of um, retaining your authenticity. Um, I think it's a question also what other people expect of you. If they meet me, they don't expect me in China. I meet my, uh, my mother-in-law. She doesn't expect me to be Chinese. She doesn't want me to be Chinese or a fake copy of a Chinese. Yeah? She expects me to be British. She likes me because I'm British. Yeah? And uh, that's what she tells me um, anyway. So I, I think this, and it, that's a big theme also in management training at the moment, authentic manager, not trying to do something. But on the other hand, um, I call it um, code switching, actually. Sometimes then... Switch. And I, I think you can also do that in training, very practically get people to just see, try to be now super direct if you're a very indirect person. Try to be very indirect if you're a direct person, just to get you a feel of that. You're not going to completely change, and you shouldn't do. If you change too much, you get into this hyper-correction where the Japanese want to, um, they've been told to shake hands, and the Germans have been told to pass the business card, their classic thing. That's You're going too far in the other direction. So... I do, I, I do think his work is important there. And I think he's got a really, that's, his book is very successful, I think, uh, is because he's got a feel for his audience as well, which I really uh, think is very important when we do training. He knows that we've got to be realistic. And that's what I think, and that's for me an experience which I have every time I go to China. It's very important that we as interculturalists keep getting new experiences. So we know it's not as easy as it might sound on the paper. And uh, I can do beautiful pictures of building bridges, but actually if you're doing a project and you're working under time pressure, it can be very difficult and annoying and emotional. Um, okay, thank you, Richard, and thank you, Carolyn, for your, your, your um, comments there. Very, very helpful in the chat. Um, we're on time. So I think, uh, Robert, it's time for me to say, did I call you Richard? That's ridiculous. Um, <laughs> thank you, Robert. Thank you. God, it happens all the time. Um, thank you for an excellent set, uh, webinar. Really, really interesting. Lots to think about and lots of questions to follow up. Um, if I was able to take one last point, um, Interesting from Bastian Broa has asked the question, and I don't know if you can answer this in a sentence or two. Why do we focus on psychological aspects when we speak of cross cultural cooperation, cross cultural intercultural cooperation? Don't we leave out decisive factors defined by the business environment, like unique rules for bookkeeping in Japan or the scarce of energy sources in certain countries? In other words, hey, come on, talk about the culture. Don't forget the business. Actually, uh, Bastian, hello. Um, <laughs> nice to see you there. I agree with you entirely. I think it's very important that we do that. And that's why I like at, at Siemens, when I was hiring intercultural trainers as freelancers to work for us, um, one of the key factors was actually um, having people with relevant business experience and background. So they knew those things. They knew about keeping in Japan or energy sources. And that was, I would say, a weakness of some, some people who were otherwise excellent trainers because we've got to get into that situation. So um, I agree wholeheartedly with, with what Bastian says there. Good, excellent. I think on that note, Robert, say thank you very, very much to you and to everybody and to the people who've answered, asked the questions and uh, been present on the webinar. And I think now let's uh, close down and let me return you to Eleanor to close the session. I would just like to thank you for having me and for the great participation. And if you want to get into contact with anybody, LinkedIn is a good way. Great. OK. And, you know, just in case anybody's forgotten it, but it's up there. It does exist. It's in paperback. Very practical, great use. Thank you very well much also from my side, from the side of the ICC. Thank you very much for this excellent webinar, Robert. It was, it was really lovely to follow you and uh, to listen to your, uh, to your thoughts. Thank you to all of you who have uh, participated in this webinar. Have a nice evening and see you at the next occasion. Bye-bye. Goodbye. Bye. 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 Thank, Thank you. you.
Bye bye. Thank you, Robert. See you Thank around. Thank you, Vincent. All the best. Yeah. See you around, huh? <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> At least on LinkedIn. <laughs> bye. Thanks so much, Robert. We'll be in touch. Take care. Oh, oh yeah. Great. You. Thank you. So yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. -bye.